Welcome, Ambassador Beckles. Minister, I'm sorry. Okay, Marie Elena. Welcome everyone to this discussion. Um, I am Gay McDougall and I am a senior fellow and distinguished uh, scholar in residence at Fordham Law School with the Leitner Center on International uh, Law and Justice and with the uh, Center on uh, Race, Law, and Justice. Uh, this is going to be a very special uh, event uh, that is hosted by UN Women. Uh, it is part of the UN Women's Participation um, in the global and uh, more local currents swirling around all of us. Uh, the dynamic opportunity that has been given to uh, all of us to talk about and address uh, issues of structural racism, anti-Black racism, that has been lurking around every corner for centuries. Uh, first through racism uh, in general, and then colonialism uh, through uh, slavery, transatlantic slavery, and the conquest uh, of uh, native lands as well. Um, we want to elevate our discussion and our condemnation of hate speech and what it has done to all of our societies. Um, the way hate speech has fueled authoritarian governments uh, on almost every continent. And the way right now it is uh, creating a surge in anti-Asian hate crimes. But most important, we will talk about the leadership of Black women at this moment in history. We are bold. We are surging to the front. Uh, we have always been there, but there's not always been room to recognize and acknowledge our leadership. But I think without a doubt now, it is clear that we are on the scene. And we as part of the overall leadership of women on all of these fronts is what UN Women is about. Especially at this time in the meeting of the, uh, the CSW uh, with the theme of women's full and effective participation in decision-making in public uh, life. And you're going to hear that thing through, uh, running throughout the next hour uh, and a half. Uh, we're going to look back and we're going to examine the ways in which movements uh, have interacted uh, with the United Nations as it is now. They're going to learn some lessons from the past. We're going to talk about how those lessons have informed our future, uh, our present, and we're going to talk about how those lessons we hope will shape the future that we want. Above all, this will be a discussion uh, with a purpose. Uh, we'll seek to learn and we'll also seek to come up with some uh, very specific um, ideas and uh, suggestions for the future. Um, and so uh, while we have an impressive group of panelists, I just want to say to you, our participants, our audience, that we're going to look to you to play a very important role. And the role is to listen and to give us at the end, the final 30 minutes, not only your questions, 
but what is it you are thinking as a consequence of hearing what we said? What ideas, specific ideas, do you have about what you and women, what all of the you and what all of us as a unified part of the movement should be doing at this moment um, in history? And how can the UN uh, give uh, you have the kind, be at the back of all of us, pushing us uh, forward in what we hope to do. Uh, we're going to move quickly in a very conversational format. Let me just tell you uh, very quickly who our panelists uh, are today. And uh, it is uh, really quite uh, awful that I'm not going to be able to give you all the details of the uh, the leadership of these women and the lives that uh, they have led. Um, but it's about ideas today. And um, we are, as I said, being hosted by you and women. So of course, we have with us very pleased to have with us the executive director of UN uh, Women, Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Ponka. Uh, we are also joined by the uh, Trinidadian Tobago uh, Minister, um, uh, Minister uh, Beckles, Penelope Beckles, who is also um, uh, for some time uh, ambassador here uh, at the United Nations. We have Ambassador Fatima Mohammed of the African Union. We have uh, Ms. Uh, Yumika Rushing, who is the NAACP uh, Chief Strategy uh, Officer. Uh, we uh, also uh, have uh, Cassandra Walchen, who is the co-convener uh, of the uh, Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable and others. So um, hold tight, we have an hour and a half. And as I said, in the final half hour, we're going to uh, be opening up to questions, but even more, uh, your ideas uh, about the future you want, um, and uh, how you can see the UN upping its game to be fit for the purpose of meeting uh, our global challenges today uh, to end um, structural racism, uh, to end hate speech, um, and to uh, create a kind of equality uh, that supports the life that we all must live. Um, let's start, uh, if you will, with the past. Now, uh, Dr. Lambo Luca, you are now uh, an executive director of uh, UN Women. Uh, but we first met, you and I, many years ago, uh, before you were vice president of your country, before you were a uh, minister uh, holding some of the most uh, critical uh, portfolios uh, in your government. Uh, you and I met when we were both uh, active members of the movement to, the global movement to uh, and apartheid. And so I, I just wanted to start uh, from there because uh, not only was that the high point, one of the high points of my life, but it was also, I think, a period when the U United Nations played perhaps its best role uh, in um, uh, coming to a consensus around uh, uh, a, a scourge like uh, apartheid and supporting local movements uh, to end it. So, I mean, tell us um, 
some of your thoughts uh, about that period and what you thought the UN was able to do best in its support of South African liberation movements at that time. Thank you, Gail, and uh, greetings to everyone uh, in all the time zones. And uh, I want to say to those that are nearer to be going to bed, please hang in there. Uh, and also greet uh, our guests and, and panelists, and thank you so much for joining us today. I also, Gail, just want to start by uh, uh, acknowledging the difficult time we are in in the US uh, as we see the stage uh, of hate crimes against uh, Asian uh, communities, uh, the killings that we have just uh, seen, the pain that has been caused to those families and say to the team, uh, we will organize uh, to have a discussion specifically around that uh, issue in the coming uh, uh, weeks, uh, because it is such a significant issue moment. Uh, we need to grapple with it because we are the United Nations. No issue that causes pain to people must go unnoticed and unattended by us. So I will ask for some of you colleagues uh, to help us to, to, to organize. And then uh, let me come to the question that you asked uh, uh, again. And then when we met with uh, young, people may, may not believe that we were once young too. <laughs> 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 we were youth activists of course. Um, you know, the issue of prejudice and hatred uh, in the context uh, of South Africa, where it, is, it was the minority oppressing the majority and doing it successfully, uh, and enjoying the global support of many countries who are powerful, who stood with apartheid. And that then also highlights the importance of global solidarity in these issues because South Africa was able to hold on this long because it enjoyed a great support. The participation of the UN on the side of those who were fighting against apartheid was a powerful uh, support system, something that the United Nations is made for. Uh, is made to stand with those who are not able to uh, fight their own battles successfully by themselves. Uh, what the United Nations did also was to provide language that was used globally to condemn apartheid. Something that we need to do in this moment with all these crimes that we are seeing against uh, that, that are emanating from racism and other prejudices. You'll remember that apartheid, I mean, uh, the United Nations called uh, apartheid a crime against humanity. That went a long way in framing the debate globally. In the same way that a, an important institution can provide such words and frame the debate uh, in a way that moves the issue forward, People who are powerful can also utter hateful words and frame the debate in a negative way. And that too has consequences. So the, the, the UN also at that time, uh, the member states were quite uh, uh, united in supporting, uh, apart, it's in supporting us. The countries that supported uh, the apartheid regime within the UN were thankfully in the minority. And the countries that opposed apartheid were very vocal. Something that sometimes when it comes to gender equality right now, when I see some of the disagreements and the pushback against gender equality, uh, I think uh, that we need to remember that 
the countries that support gender equality have got voices and they must use those voices. So I think the conclusion is that voice and the use of institution is always very helpful to frame the arguments in society. I think that's absolutely right. The other thing that I remember, and one of the things that drew me into the UN for uh, uh, the first time in the 1970s, early 1970s, was that the UN had a series of convenings, uh, both through the Special Committee Against Apartheid, which you will remember, right? Um, and also uh, uh, sponsoring or co-sponsoring conferences around the world. And that allowed people to come together uh, to share ideas about uh, opposing uh, apartheid and to make it a popular idea, popular not just among governments, but among uh, individuals. Uh, and that was a very, uh, I think, useful and, and, and uh, you know, insightful thing to do in a way of fueling movements and helping movements in turn uh, feel uh, further action in the UN uh, setting. Um, that, 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 that reminds me very much of the other high point in my life. Um, I was uh, born in the Jim Crow South and started my life as well as my career as part of the civil rights movement. And I um, will uh, never forget seeing the flag of the United Nations flying high uh, in the Selma, the famous Selma to Montgomery uh, march. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the chance of so many uh, of the marchers uh, for human rights. Um, and so, uh, you know, you make a, I, I, I wanted to bring you into this conversation as well to talk just a bit about uh, the NAACP. You are chief strategist of the NAACP, an organization that started uh, as the last century began, uh, as the chief organization leading uh, the fight against uh, structural racism in the US. There were others, uh, but that uh, one in NAACP has lasted in its leadership and it still persists. And so I want you to, 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 to help um, our audience think a little bit about the, uh, the role that the NAACP played and how the UN gave, um, uh, gave uh, sort of support and, uh, you know, that the, 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 the sense of uh, being very much on the right track and inspiration. Thank you for that. And again, it's, it's wonderful to be here. You're right, we are a 112 year organization and we've been on the front lines of civil rights a, a very, very long time. But I wanna hearken us back uh, to 1947, nearly 74 years ago, the NAACP petitioned the then newly created United Nation to hold the US accountable for human rights violations against African-Americans. NACP leaders believe that talking about civil rights as, as human rights would amplify the freedom struggles of black people in America as part of a global movement for equality. As the petition's title suggests, this was an appeal to the world and is now widely considered one of the first organized efforts to focus on human rights issues in the United States. Uh, you are familiar with historian Carol Anderson, who recounts the story eloquently in her book, Eyes Off the Prize, The United Nations and the African-American Struggle for Human Rights. Those who know her work recall that the, the petition was kept confidential, and at that time, the United Nations took no action on it. It did, however, shine a spotlight on racial discrimination in the U.S., and like so many critical moments in our history, that was a spark that lit a fire. 
it was the precursor to the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, affirming our collective dignity, our worth and equal rights and freedom of all people. And it was a precursor to the UN's Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination 22 years later in 1969. And so think about what the world looked like in 47, in, in 48, and in 69. I think what's most striking about the Dubois petition is if we read excerpts of it today, some 74 years later, you might ask if we were talking about 2020. <laughs> Of course, the UN has adopted various resolutions condemning racism and racist policies around the globe, including in the US uh, just last year. And uh, these are the moments that define us and affirm our collective humanity and just significant role that the UN has played uh, in the African-American struggle in the US. Absolutely, and I, um, I constantly refer back to the inspiration that I took from the fact that there was W.B. Du Bois, Walter White, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, you know, the whole array of uh, Black American leadership um, at the conferences uh, that came together to form uh, the United Nations. Uh, what foresight, what vision it took uh, for them to say, look, this could be a way for us to have uh, other forms in which to plead the rights and, 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 and in fact, to have broader rights uh, than existed. I will now say, as I was uh, the first American that then came to uh, sit uh, on the uh, UN uh, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which oversees compliance by all countries around the world uh, with the UN Race Convention that you mentioned, uh, Unica. Uh, uh, it, is, it was such an incredible honor to be able to do that. And that treaty uh, is uh, one that is among the uh, most ratified uh, in the world. Um, and it uh creates the opportunity uh to interact on a regular basis with country by country uh about their laws their policies what have you on racial uh discrimination certainly not the end <laughs> of racial discrimination yet but um it's played a phenomenal um, a role that could not have even been uh, uh, thought of in 1947, 1945. So um, the NAACP and its leaders were there at the beginning, had the vision of the future at the beginning. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, they would have, as I'm going to ask you now, in this current moment in history, uh, seeing how precedent your organization has been about the future. What kind of relationship do you uh, see having uh, with the uh, United Nations going forward, and particularly uh, with you and women? Well, it's a partnership, and you know that we have an, an existing uh, MOU, and we've been and partners in the fight uh, for, for a very long time. And I, I think that uh, those lessons of the past left us some nuggets and a blueprint on how we might uh, continue to strive and, and, and work together. And so our primary goal is to strengthen that uh, relationship going forward uh, and to stand together against racism wherever we find it. Uh, uh, particularly over the last uh, several years here in the U.S., it's been a trying time for, for our people, but we can see vestiges of that in other places around the world. And so the partnership with the U.N. Uh, helps us to stand stalwart, uh, really aligned to our mission and our, our vision uh, for, you know, a society where everybody is equal and can thrive. And the U.N. helps us uh, in that partnership. And we are just honored to partner uh, 
in every way that we, we can and stand together. Uh, I'm wondering, um, uh, Madam um, uh, Lombo, whether you have any thoughts about specific activities uh, that you might fashion coming from your notion of the um, uh, movement against uh, apartheid and carrying them through uh, the era of knowing uh, how critical uh, the fight against uh, racism has continued to be uh, since then. Um, are there some specific actions that you might see uh, putting your organization more behind that that comes out of your learnings of both sides. I, I, I'll give you some some thoughts about uh, the uh, uh, decade on people of African descent um, and the um, the anniversary, the twenty plus twenty anniversary of the Third World Conference. Uh, against uh, racism that was held in, in Durban. Yeah, actually, uh, we sort of have come full circle uh, with those uh, iconic uh, conferences that, uh, that, that you mentioned. And it, it happens that uh, we're still at the same place, you know, yeah. how much time has passed and how much we found ourselves still discussing more or less the same issues, but with a different generation. Uh, I think one of the important uh, issue of this time is how we can also make these issues intergenerational so that they are part and parcel of the struggles that young people are taking forward and they are global in, in nature as well. Uh, the important thing about the, the Devon conference uh, was the fact that uh, it did bring together everybody and that the, the United Nations was able to use its considerable convening capacity and power to bring everybody so that all the issues and everyone's issue that, that for, uh, uh, who is affected by racism is on the table and there's an understanding by each one of us about how much uh, broad this issue of and deep this issue of racism is. Uh, it was also important that there was a strong participation of civil society and activists. The one thing that I think we are desperately needing to do in the UN is to in inject the activism in the system because there are sometimes limitations about states. Uh, it is not in the nature of governments, uh, most governments to be activists. You find the activist government, yeah. but it's not a common thing. Activism uh, is enriched by engaging and working together with civil society. So how I see this is that we as the United Nations have got to bring together people who are not just representatives of states, but we have to work and have civil society have a say. In some way, what we're trying to do, for instance, with generation equality that we, we will be taking forward as, as a response to, be, to, the, to the Beijing uh, platform for action, we are bringing together all these actors. So in the context of race, an entry point that is formidable into the United Nations actions uh, is something that I would strongly recommend. And I think the way we are composed today uh, is, is, a, is a bit of that, uh, that uh, we, we, we actually are engaging with uh, civil society, uh, uh, activists, uh, civil rights leaders, uh, as, as important uh, pen holders, even in some cases, of the agreements we signed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, one of my lessons from, from working uh, in uh, the, with the Special Committee Against Apartheid in the uh, 1970s, uh, that had a very uh, strong contingent of uh, 
civil society activists as uh, a part of its constant uh, convenings. Uh, part of my lesson from that, as well as my lessons from the years that I have uh, worked uh, with the uh, human rights mechanisms of the UN in Geneva, where there's a little bit of a different uh, protocol on uh, civil society actors. If you issue the invitations and you open the doors, civil society will come. Yeah. And, uh, you know, civil society, I would say, we all feel in Geneva is the engine that makes the human rights mechanisms of the UN move. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that that has been proven to be uh, the case uh, throughout the years. And uh, that's one of the things that I, I hope our note taker about the future uh, will mm -hmm. uh, note as well. There are a lot of lessons I think to be learned from the way civil society is incorporated into the work of the UN in Geneva that has not yet been included in um, the work in um, uh, the UN agencies, uh, which maybe could be thought more about. Um, Ms. Rushing, you have any other thoughts that you would uh, bring forward ideas, specific ideas about lessons from interactions during the civil rights movement that could be thought more about in the future? You know, I, I think that um, the, collectively, we, we must just continue our work together on anti-racism. You know, rooting out this false notion of a hierarchy of human value is, is critically important uh, domestically and globally. And we each have a role uh, to play in that. I do like uh, the work, uh, and I think that we can do the work to scale that we uh, learned from some of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. I know that there are lots of stakeholders, philanthropy at large uh, around the world who are recreating uh, the idea of truth and reconciliation uh, and even looking uh, beyond that uh, to uh, the work around healing. Healing is such a critical component of, of, of the, the actions that we must take uh, to move forward. Uh, and so I, I think there's some valuable lessons to be learned in, in, uh, in those endeavors. And I think we've got to continue to, to study and hold ourselves accountable for our track record on human and civil rights. Uh, the UN is uniquely positioned to help us do that from the world state. Wonderful. I want to now bring in uh, some other voices here um, as you know, the uh, and then the main players in the United Nations are uh, the states, um, and um, they uh, come to the UN in a number of different ways, uh, both uh, uh, as uh, diplomats representing individual uh, uh, countries and also uh, uh, diplomats uh, representing uh, regions. Uh, so first, I want to um, uh, give the microphone for a few minutes uh, to ask um, Minister Penelope Beckles of uh, Trinidad and Tobago, um, who uh, also has held so many positions um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, gives <clears throat> much uh, uh, weight to um, her thoughts and comments of, about the future. Uh, you spent many years at the uh, UN as uh, representing uh, your country. And the I always felt that the uh, Caribbean countries have played a particular role uh, at the UN. And, and even more than that, held out a particular sort of um, uh, uh, possibility of hope for uh, African descendant uh, communities. Uh, first of all, in the US and other places in uh, the uh, hemisphere of the Americas. Uh, but now, uh, as the reality is, um, African descendant populations, the diaspora is 
and worldwide, all through Europe and Asia as well. Um, but I want uh, to uh, hear your uh, thoughts and remembrances about the work that you were involved in uh, against racism during the years that you were uh, at the uh, UN. Those were years in which uh, the Intergovernmental uh, Committee uh, on uh, the follow-up to the Durban Declaration and Program of Action uh, was uh, very um, critical involvement uh, of the General Assembly on race issues. Um, give us some of your thoughts about that period and where it leads you to today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, let me first of all thank UN Women for organizing this virtual event on the role of the United Nations in the struggle against racial inequality, past, present, and future. And let me say what a pleasure it is to be on this panel with, of course, um, the Executive Chair, uh, Homzeli Lamba Nuka. So happy to see you. And of course, Ambassador Mohammed um, and all my sisters. Um, for participating in this panel. It's, it's a pleasure and I hope that they are um, missing me as much as I'm missing um, seeing them at the United Nations. Um, you know, after we had our session yesterday, I was able to look at a program where Kim Jamie became the first black uh, mayor of Boston. And I, I really thought I would just um, give her a a congratulation. I think it's just a great way to start this morning because in looking at that program and realizing, first of all, we never had a woman and you never had a black person in almost a hundred years serving as the mayor. Um, and when you were talking yesterday about progress and positive, I thought that was something that I had to mention today. Um, but specifically going to Trinidad and Tobago, one of the interesting things um, following slavery and the abolition of slavery is that in 1985, Trinidad and Tobago became the first nation to designate a holiday to commemorate uh, emancipation. So emancipation is observed on the 1st of August in Trinidad and Tobago on every day. And I thought that was just, it's a great decision. Um, and a couple of other countries have followed us. Um, but particularly now at the United Nations, Trinidad and Tobago continues to lend support to a number of UN initiatives that deals with um, non-discrimination against people of African descent. And more specifically, in 2007, the UN General Assembly agreed to the establishment of this permanent memorial, which I'm sure you're familiar with, at the UN headquarters to honor the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. And this was based on CARICOM's recommendation that the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade be commemorated in this fitting manner, which is of course the Ark of the Return. And that was designed by a Haitian American architect called Rodney Lyon. Um, and this was selected for the use at the permanent memorial to honor the victims of the transatlantic um, slave trade, and this was unveiled, as you know, on the 25th of March in 2015. And that would have simultaneously marked the beginning of the international decade for the persons of African descent. Now, one of the other important things is that Trinidad and Tobago is also a member of the steering committee um, for the organization of events to commemorate the International Day of the Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. And for me, that was a big event because what that actually allowed was for the coming together of the various cultures of the CARICOM region. So you would have the opportunity, as you know, Trinidad and Tobago invented the only instrument of the 20th century, which is the steel pan. So that your culture and of course the food, and you would have, of course, the, mar the marrying of what is now some of I guess our indigenous food together with food from Africa, um, which we would of course have available to virtually everyone at the United Nations. And probably the other important thing would be that in 2013, 
of the Caribbean Heads of Government established the CARICOM Reparations Commission. And the mandate there was to prepare a case for reparatory justice for the region's indigenous and African descendants who are victims of crimes against uh, humanity. And I mean, there's a 10 point uh, that was established by that commission. Uh, and that continues to be very important being led of course by Professor Hilary Beckles. So that I, I mean, being at the United Nations would have allowed me therefore to, uh, to ensure not just Trinidad and Tobago, but CARICOM as a region participating in these several activities. Um, and I know that, you know, there isn't much time uh, and I'll be prepared to discuss a little more, but for now, I think that's a good start. Yeah, I think that's an excellent start, especially given the um, resurgence, if you will, of the uh, discussion about reparations uh, for slavery and colonialism. Uh, now, now coming back into the fore in a much more uh, considered, um, shall I say concrete, detailed uh, way. And so those of us who have been uh, trying to find our way and help others find their way in that discussion, particularly in the United States, have taken um, a lot of um, uh, notice of the uh, CARICOM 10 points and the level of uh, negotiation. Of course, that is a negotiation. You see that is happening government to government, government to governments, yeah. <laughs> shall I say. Um, and, um, you know, in our country, in the United States, our discussion uh, must be one that happens between uh, our uh, population, uh, descendants of slaves, uh, and our government. See, uh, you may come, would you agree? Um, and um, it's a very difficult uh, winding road to uh, negotiate. Um, but in any event, I think one of the themes that I hear uh, from all is the importance of convenings and um, how that gives you a chance. I remember in the run up to, I was very involved in the Durban um, uh, uh, conference um, as a representative of uh, the, uh, the CERD, the, the UN conference, uh, uh, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination to the conference. So I organized uh, a number of parts of it. And um, uh, it, it, it caused such a, especially within the Americas at that time, it caused such an incredible uh, uh, newfound unity among people of African descent in the Americas from Canada, down to uh, uh, Chile. Um, and we met several times over the period of the prep comms uh, to discuss who we were and you know what our backgrounds were and what our priorities were for the future. Um, and so as I say, convenings are extremely important. And reparations was discussed now and again and again. Uh, as was uh, affirmative action. Um, and it led to a number of bilaterals, if I could call it that, uh, between civil society actors in the United States, very involved in affirmative action programs to uh, Brazil uh, and other places uh, in the uh, American um, hemisphere. It, it, it brings me now to Ambassador uh, Fatima uh, Mohammed of the um, African uh, Unity, African uh, Union. There's so much one could say about the importance of the African Union um, to consolidating uh, a, a common uh, set of um, uh, views on certain issues among 
uh, the countries in Africa across a, a massive continent. Um, the five regions uh, or sub-regions of Africa. But uh, I think it would be um, important in this um, discussion uh, to uh, sort of hear you talk a bit about the, um, the role that Africa and the African Union has seen itself in the larger struggle for racism um, across the globe. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. McDougall. It's um, really an honor for me to be here with you um, uh, this morning uh, to discuss uh, such a fundamental uh, topic, uh, I think, for, for, for all of us. And um, it's particularly an honor for me to share uh, this space with, with all these phenomenal women. Um, such a pleasure to see uh, my sisters, Edi uh, um Minister uh, Beckles, uh, nice to see you again, and uh, good morning to everyone who's also joining us today. Um, let me start very quickly by stating maybe, um, you know, as the AU representative here um, uh, at the UN, um, that, you know, you, you just mentioned the five, five regions, but it is important important to note that we do consider that we have six regions. Yes, <laughs> I was coming there. <laughs> I was coming there. <laughs> Great, okay. And that in 2003, right, our AU heads of states um, recognized basically the African diaspora um, as, as the sixth region and this uh, exists in our constitution. So it is, it is very important to, to state that. Um, in addition to that, uh, at the level of the commission, we also have a dedicated department that uh, works um, towards uh, mainstreaming the participation of the um, African diaspora uh, across departments. Um, and so there are a number of partnership frameworks, a uh, wide range of um, uh, policy and activities um, that um, uh, works towards kind of mainstreaming and enjoy, uh, ensuring that, you know, uh, the diaspora is part of our uh, development agenda, which is Agenda agenda 2063. Um, now, your question was directly focused on the AU, but I think it's important for me to just step back and mention uh, uh, very quickly, you know, the importance of, of, of the UN as our global institution and how I see the AU's role kind of fit, fit into that, right? Um, uh, because I think, you know, fundamentally when we look at the issue of um, international peace and security, um, the role of the UN, the role of the Security Council and how Africa is a continent um, on the agenda of the Security Council constitutes 60, 70% of their work. Um, and where the UN is concerned and the partnership between the AU and the UN we're supposed to be building cooperation, um, ensuring uh, we're promoting um, social progress, better living standards for our people, but most importantly, also promoting human rights, which is right the, the, the topic um, uh, of, of today. And since its inception as, as, as an organization, um, there has been uh, fundamentally uh, at the core of this, this uh, unrelenting fight, if you like, uh, against racism, racial discrimination, and all of that as declared in um, the Charter of Human Rights. Um, and then there are a number of declarations and decisions and so on and so forth. But I think the fundamental question is, um, despite uh, all these um, policies and de decisions, why are we still today uh, talking uh, about, about uh, racism and discrimination? What is it um, that isn't working? Um, and in addition to that, I would like to just uh, mention um, uh, very quickly that um, at the end of last year, um, the African group of ambassadors here at the UN um, actually um, uh, submitted a declaration on anti-racism um, following concerns uh, within uh, the institution itself. Um, and uh, they called upon the SG to ensure that within the context of zero, to zero tolerance uh, within, uh, within, within the UN, 
that all reports of racism um, and allegations of racism and discrimination in the institution are investigated. So I think there is clearly a fundamental problem and therefore um, this kind of discussion is um, a key um, towards ensuring that, first of all, we recognize that the policies do exist, but the question is why is it that we're still um, here today and having this conversation? Where the AU is concerned um, as an institution, there are a number of um, efforts to answer your uh, question directly. In addition to well, what I'm- Well, let me just, uh, if I could just interrupt sure. you, because I don't want us to move too quickly off that point. Sure. Um, so that we're sure that uh, everyone is, is quite aware uh, that through the efforts of the combination of, it was essentially the <laughs> African undersecretaries of state, if, if I'm correct, under, under, under secretary generals, the African undersecretary generals signed this really uh, unprecedented uh, open statement um, about uh, in support really of the Black Lives Matter movement, but also to say uh, we have our problems internally in the United Nations, in the secretary that, have, uh, that are rarely discussed uh, but certainly have never been uh, addressed. Um, and uh, it moved the Secretary General to, in response, also unprecedented, hold his, uh, a um, town hall meeting of sorts mm -hmm. uh, to call on all units, divisions, departments, bureaus, et cetera, to take this issue on um, and to hold a series of discussions um, uh, and to uh, find solutions. And it brings us to today because uh, this is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the actions being taken by UN Women um, uh, under the uh, executive director's leadership. There have been a series of internal discussions and examinations of uh, problems and solutions. Um, and now there, this is the beginning of a set of um, external, if you will, outside discussions, because <clears throat> I think we all realize that uh, we can say we're not racist. Uh, that's not enough. Uh, we have to say we are actively against racism. And to be so, you have to look inside and you have to look outside in a larger uh, environment. Um, and uh, the, the fact that this was really set in motion by uh, the African members of of uh, the secretariat as well as governments, I think is really uh, groundbreaking for the US. Um, I would also say, uh, just to add to your list, and I was part of the effort that put the, the mess, the um, issue of George Floyd's killing before the UN Human Rights Council. And um, I got phenomenal assistance and support for that uh, through uh, the Africa group of the UN, the 54 uh, countries that, um, that were willing to take the order, you know, to the, to the Human Rights Council, to the uh, president of the Human Rights Council and to move it through that body uh, to come up with uh, a solution. It was a incredible um, support uh, for um, uh, your uh, uh, sisters and brothers in the U.S., but also an incredible statement of the commitment, continuing commitment of uh, Africa uh, to uh, ending racism. Uh, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on behalf of many, uh, <laughs> let me take this 
opportunity to thank you. And so much of that uh, was taken on, that effort was taken on by the South African ambassador uh, to uh, the UN in Geneva. And in her absence, I also want to thank her for playing that, that incredible role. Let me, let me, because because time is moving fast now, I want to also bring in um, our final panelist, uh, Cassandra uh, Welchin, who is uh, with the um, Mississippi Black Women's um, Roundtable. She is uh, Cassandra Walton, she's executive director of Mississippi Black Women's uh, Roundtable. Um, and uh, for those of you um, who know the US, you know that uh, Mississippi holds a special place in uh, the uh, imaginations and hearts of Black Americans on the question of racism, both bad and good. <laughs> and, uh, the Mississippi uh, Black Women's Roundtable is part of the good. Uh, and is, uh, we've asked her to uh, give us some thoughts about the future um, as one of the younger uh, <laughs> members of our panel. Um, you know, what do you see in terms of the kind of collaboration that we talked about throughout this program between um, the UN and uh, domestic movements, both in South Africa and the US over the years. Um, what, what, what kinds of uh, ideas would you have about how to uh, further link uh, the uh, global to the local uh, in, the struggles that you're waging and seeing happen in uh, Mississippi. Well, thank you for having me um, here um, on this amazing panel with all these super uh, power sheroes. Um, and so I'm just so thankful to be here. Um, and also joining me, well, my sister from Mississippi, Yumi, uh, as well. It's just really a great honor to be here uh, with you all. Um, I also bring you greetings from um, this hospitality state and so many of um, our Mississippi women are, are here joining us. And so they wanted me to um, let you know, come on down to Mississippi so you can get some good food and hear some good blues. <laughs> <laughs> um, this conversation has been really rich. Um, and I think one of the things that um, Madam Executive Director said was this is a global solidarity moment um, in our history. Um, where these movements are so interconnected. Um, when I think about the black woman in Mississippi who is struggling to put food on the table um, to take care of her child, um, I also think about that's the black woman too who is struggling to get her voting rights uh, returned back to her. Um, she's also the same mama who is uh, working to make sure that her child has the same education um, so that that child can grow up to be a productive citizen. So these movements are interconnected, right? And so we can't take one without the other. They are interconnected. And so movement building is a part of the struggle. And I also heard Madam Secretary talk, uh, Madam Executive Director talk about uh, activism, like in Mississippi and where we have come from, activism has fueled our fight and has fueled uh, where we have come from. I mean, it was the fight and the activism of a Fannie Lou Hamer who sits right behind me, right? Um, uh, Dr. Elsie Dorsey, right? Um, and Mo Moody. So these are the women who have fueled the fight that kept things moving because we've been a part of every um, social, political, economic, environmental movement from the past till now. We still stand in the gap and we still show up and we show up not only at the voting booth, but we show up at the policy tables too, right? And so mm -hmm. those are the things that um, that I say is that you know our movements are interconnected, and so they how, must stay. How, how can you see uh, a support coming from the global level, from the UN level, to that kind of concrete work on the ground? 
Yes. So, um, you know, the global South and the U.S. South are so, you know, so interconnected and our struggles are again, very much the same. We're fighting for liberation for our people. And so what I would say is I would invite the United Nations of women to come to Mississippi, come and bring um, the framework around human rights um, is so incredible. I use it often, um, but I would say let's come and let's convene. Um, let's have a conversation together. Let's build relationships. Let's build partnerships together. Um, I remember going to Guatemala um, a couple of years ago and sitting among the human rights defenders who were the women, and we learned so much together. Our struggles were the same, but there were some innovative things that they were doing that I hadn't even thought about. And so I think bringing that kind of community together with Mississippi Black women, uh, with the Southern Black women, uh, would be so incredible and so powerful. And making the um, the information accessible to our people, um, but also letting us, I think I said it earlier when I first joined, let's get on one another, let's get y'all come to our front porch and drink some sweet tea and let our grandmamas cook you some hot grits, right? So let's commune together. Um, and that's how we can share. And so that is something that I think is so important and so needed. Um, as we share our activism, share our struggles, is come and be with us and let us talk and, 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 and learn together. A learning community is so key to our activism and to our movements. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna open the panel up now for any other thoughts about uh, future visions. And I'm, I'm going to uh, start with our um, uh, Madam E.D., because you and I are connected with a bold new uh, initiative. Um, uh, I've been asked to be on the board and maybe I was at the beginning of the idea of a black feminist fund, a global black feminist fund. Um, and uh, three uh, uh, women from different parts of the world have taken up the charge and uh, with uh, uh, incredibly, um, incredibly uh, generous funding now from the Ford Foundation, uh, you know, this is becoming a reality. And so uh, uh, you have been asked uh, to be uh, the first champion of the uh, Black Feminist Fund. And I just uh, wanted to give you uh, a minute to uh, say something about that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gay. Indeed, uh, it's such a, a, an exciting uh, initiative. Uh, it's good that it's also global because uh, at this point in time, uh, the world is so small. We are so much in touch with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, in a, we are talking to people all around the world. So something like that ought to be uh, relevant uh, for women, uh, black feminists, wherever they are. Uh, and the, the challenges that they are being faced uh, you know, we she, she intimated uh, uh, in Mississippi what they are facing. Uh, uh, Ambassador Fatima also hints of, you know, the vastness of the issues within the AU. We are talking about a really large constituency. So this fund must reflect that, but also we are in a hurry. Uh, we don't have time now for organic growth, et cetera. We actually want to build bold moves uh, when we address it. And I think the fund must embody that. In any case, uh, I think of many Black women that we all know on whose shoulders we stand. They don't like small stuff. They really yes. take big risks. Yeah. They handle big issues in their hearts and in their lives. And when you then think about also all the other issues that we've been talking about, that concern us, the prejudices that we are na navigating that are intersecting 
you can't have a Mickey Mouse uh, fund. It really yes. has to be serious, a serious fund in size and in outreach. Yes, yes. So this fund uh, uh, we are hoping will uh, be kicked off with, and, and, and it looks like this is going to be quite possible, 100 million uh, US dollars. Uh, so it's going to be uh, it's going large. To be yeah. Can I just say, also, uh, let us not forget that we still have to host the, 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 the summit that was uh, called for by Black women in Brazil on behalf of all Black women uh, as part of the decade, uh, yes. uh, people of African descent. So we, right. we still have homework too. Yes, yes, we've got a lot of things coming up and, uh, you know, we're all going to be very, very uh, busy uh, for the upcoming, well, we always are, you know, we, we women always are busy, uh, we're always uh, leading, uh, and our visions are always uh, bold, um, and so uh, uh, I think that uh, that's our reality, and I'm very happy to share it with all of you. We have uh, just uh, 25 minutes, and so I want to uh, get to some of the uh, questions and comments uh, that are coming uh, from um, our audience, okay? Um, the, um, and because time is so short, I'm gonna I'm going to put three questions on the floor uh, so that um, you can pick uh, what you might want to best speak to. Uh, number one, what do you see as the next small step? After you just said we got to take big steps. Um, a small organization uh, can do to drive racial equality uh, for it. That's one. Uh, two is um, the UN has historically done powerful work in fighting racism, yet the structure of the UN um, and the prevalence of nonprofits in the developing world may constitute uh, to systemic racism because from my perception, the most powerful wealthy countries tend uh, to be the ones with most power. Um, how can the UN address these power dynamics? Um, yes, okay, the UN is, is dominant. It, it is in a very fundamental way, a club of states, of governments um, that seem to be largely dominated uh, by the global north, countries of the global north and richest countries. Um, how, how do we address that? Um, uh, especially uh, in the context of anti-racism, anti-black racism, um, problems relating to hate speech, um, et cetera. And uh, here's number three. How can UN make countries accountable uh, for their anti-immigration laws? What is the UN doing to improve diversity in executive leadership? Let me start, I... yes, yes, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I think those were, um... Brilliant, brilliant questions, and I'll probably try to respond and kind of collapse um, the uh, the three questions together and just make some right. some recommendations on what what I think we can do. Um, I think first of all, there's um, a need for institutional reforms um, across the board, right? Uh, whether it's on the national level or, or within our global and regional institutions, um, we need to ensure that you know our systems in general. Um, focus on not repeating the historical injustice um, that, 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 that we've experienced and that they're not repeated. And um, this is across, across the board. 
Um, I think we also generally need to ensure that there is kind of like a zero tol tol tolerance policy that is actually implemented um, across the board. Take it off paper. There has to be implementation and we need to push for it. Um, I think Cassandra mentioned a very fundamental point, uh, which I'd like to reemphasize as well, which is um, the need to be able to learn from each other, because I think historically, there's so much that we can learn. Um, first of all, um, in, in Africa, you know, the issue of um, transitional justice, for example, particularly when it comes to the Southern uh, African region and their history and the issue of transitional justice, I think um, many other regions can, can learn uh, from that. And there has to be intergenerational discussions because many of those who were part of the struggle in the 50s and the 60s need to ensure that the next generation understand how the African diaspora in particular was part of the liberation of the struggles um, of Africa and why these inter-regional discussions have to take place as much as possible so that um, you know, people um, from Africa are having discussions with the Americas, including Latin America and the Caribbean, um, African diaspora in Europe, in Asia as well. And we have to use all of our platforms to keep educating, to keep sensitizing, and um, to keep um, advocating. Um, otherwise, you know, we, we lose history and then we lose the reality. At some point, we start wondering why it is we're going through this struggle, which is, which is not new. So definitely yeah. learning, learning from each other. And I'm definitely going to take you up on your invitation, Cassandra. Um, we need to find ways of, you know, using our platforms to ensure that we, we keep, uh, we keep um, this conversation going. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to tackle these uh, questions? Number one, what can small organization do? Number two, what, what, what happens? What's the way to deal with the dominance of uh, the continuing dominance of global North rich countries uh, within the UN and structures and outside? Huh? And then the internal issue uh, about uh, racial discrimination and leadership. Yes, Ambassador, uh, Minister. Uh, I wanted to share um, in Trinidad and Tobago was, for example, the establishment of an Equal Opportunities Commission. You know, it's it's um, it's a, a very direct way of persons having the opportunity to challenge things like discrimination, uh, whether it be on the workplace. Um, you know, so that that's one of the things that I would I would recommend. Um, our former Prime Minister Patrick managed. Manning, he established um, a center for ethnic studies um, at the University of the West Indies. I think that is something that um, it's, it's a good recommendation. Uh, thinking about an ombudsman uh, is probably the third one. Um, and the establishment of a police complaints authority, because when we think a lot of issues of discrimination, I mean, it's in a lot of countries, it's attached to the rule and function of the police. So, you know, those are some of the suggestions that I have, um, specifically in terms of countries. Okay. All right. Anyone else? To, yes. I wanted to add, I come, um, talk a little bit about the, the person who asked the question, what can small organizations um, do? Um, one of my mentor, um, Hollis Watkins, um, oh. the great... Um, civil rights um, activist and organizer um, said to me that racism is about domination and control. That's what it's about. And it's about taking the power away from people um, so that they can dominate and control. And so one of the things that I learned through my organizing work is that uh, for small organizations, one thing we got to do is organize, 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 and build a base. Build a base of support around the things that your community care about. And so that's engaging them in the process, but also um, doing what the ambassador said and Madam Executive Director is really building in this intergenerational model, like nothing that I do um, and that we do um, is without, you know, the intergenerational. We got to have a wisdom infrastructure 
so we can look from the past to now, but then also bring these young people in who are so innovative um, and have and so creative and have the energy. And so bringing in that intergenerational um, organizing model is gonna be really key and meeting with the people. I always say too that, you know, you can't just do the direct service work. Um, direct service work only put a Band-Aid on and we got to tackle the systems. And so we got to bring um, the people to the policy table so they can be a part of the implementation and the formation of those policies. And so going to the people, hearing what it is, focus groups, whatever it is, hearing what they want to say and need, and then begin to organize, educate, and then do a movement so that um, they can be a part of that policy table and then taking it also to the voting booth. So those are the things that I would say to that to that organization. Okay, good. Uh, yes. Ms. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that I can't say enough about the importance of, of symbols and action. Uh, dismantling is a strategy. Uh, last year when the Confederate flag came down in Mississippi, it revived a generation of young people. But we were so empowered to see that symbol of hatred come down. And so dismantling is a, is a real strategy that small organizations can really lead on uh, and then help us all sort of embrace. And then I think that structural racism uh, requires a structural response. I can't say enough in agreement to the sort of institutional reforms comment earlier. Um, we were really happy and pleased to see uh, this year, uh, this administration has really embraced uh, racial equity uh, and looking at it in, in terms of uh, institutional racism in the government. And I would implore other countries to look at institutional racism in government and what can government do to turn the mirror on itself to begin an active strategy of dismantling racism. And then, you know, one, one piece about the leadership um, uh, you know, issue at the UN is how do you then get, uh, when we talk about the diaspora now spread over um, almost every continent, uh, but we don't see these uh, people, black and uh, men, women, uh, Asian men, women, what have you, rising to the top uh, and then entering the diplomatic uh, service and showing up, their faces showing up uh, in leadership positions at the, the UN and other international organizations. Um, what can we do about that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Madam E.D. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually think it's important that uh, we provide uh, guidelines that enforce uh, the movement towards the direction uh, we want uh, to follow. Uh, that uh, we, we state what it is that we, we want to be, how we want our institutions uh, to look like who should be there and make that part of our policies. Uh, because uh, if we don't have any guidelines, something to hold us accountable, we can go in circles and then don't have a mechanism to see, uh, to still feel and touch the change that uh, we are making. I mean, the things about uh, these uh, instruments uh, such as policy is that they may not make a racist to like you, but they can stop them from taking away your opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it creates the, those barriers, which are also enablers for, for the good movement to happen. Mm -hmm. On the of symbols and, and, and the importance of removing them, I think that is something important because once, when you have these symbols, you actually legitimize the bad idea. You give it credibility by ha having the symbol, you normalize the situation. By removing the symbols, you create 
uh, 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 I mean, you remove the symbol, you take away that uh, credibility, but also you also create controversy, which is also good because then people talk about it. You hear the different sides of the argument in the process. Yes, yes, Ambassador. Did I see your hand? I think we've got to stop pretending that diversity is innovative. Diversity is a baseline, it is expected. Yes. Uh, and we've got to keep uh, helping people to understand that. That's right, that's right, that's right. Um, Ambassador Mohammed, I thought I, heard, I saw your hand, no? No, I didn't raise my hand. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Here's a question. Uh, do you think that it is possible to work together, all racialized women, in our struggle together against racism? I'd like to answer that. In 2015, um, I, along with um, another organization, co founded an initiative called the Mississippi Women's Economic Security Initiative. And we brought together women, and Yamika was a part of that. Um, we brought together women from across sectors. They were activists, they were legislators. They were just a combination of, of women. And they were black and they were white. And what was interesting about that um, conversation was we wanted to say Mississippi doesn't have a women's agenda. And we want to bring a comprehensive women's agenda together so that we can center women at our policy debate and our budget um, um, budget making priorities, and the question was asked, um, "What?" Well, as we were talking about what was important, white women said gender was important, black women said race was important, and then this amazing uh, woman, Dr. Safia Omari, said, "Why are we choosing race or gender?" Both are important and that's the thing that can divide us. But what I realized in that moment is that we couldn't do work together until we had a grounding together. And so we had to ground ourselves into what, what, was, what does that mean for all of us? What's the historical context there? And then how do we meet to talk to, to work together? Because that could destroy a coalition and destroy a movement when it's all important. And so we did, we had to ground each other on racial and gender equity. And in the South, it, you have to, you can't do any work without um, having a racial lens, but oftentimes you can do work without having a gender lens. And we said both was important. And so we put together um, some trainings on race and, gen race, race and gender equity. And we talked about those things. And so that grounded us and then we were able to move forward. And so, so your question is, yes, it can be done, but we must have a grounding together in order to do it. Okay, I want to uh, ask the last question here because we're running out of time. Uh, this is the last from the audience. How can the UN overcome the resistance of some G7 countries to acknowledging racism and collecting uh, the necessary data to uh, uh, address it. Uh, we can't imagine what we can't measure, uh, or at least we don't have to imagine <laughs> what we have not measured. <laughs> um, and I would say just to tweak that question a little bit, let's talk about both outside and inside. Uh, the UN, because um, I know that there is actually no data uh, internally to the UN secretary on um, anything other than the passport that people carry. Not whether you're a minority person in that country, and in G7 countries, you've got a large number of minorities. So they don't get called out for the, for the reality that uh, they have a lot of staff at the UN, oh, very few minorities. Uh, so look, you know, the, the committee that I have sat on for eight years, the Committee Against Racism, has 
said over and over again, it is absolutely necessary to have uh, data. You need to collect data disaggregated by all of the relevant socioeconomic uh, groupings uh, that uh, will reveal to you the actual inequalities that exist. Only then can you start designing programs and approaches uh, to solve those problems. And only with that kind of data can you tell whether the programs you've designed are relevant and are working or not. So how, as this questioner says, how can we deal with the fact that uh, there is so much resistance uh, to collecting uh, data, both outside in countries and inside in the U.S. Minister uh, Beckles, can you um, offer some thoughts here? Uh, and I'm going to ask everyone to be quick because we only have a few minutes. Okay, so I mean, you talk about the resistance as it relates to collecting data um, and whether there is a willingness to deal with some of the inequalities that exist. I mean, during my time at the UN, that is um, the issue of data collection, whether it is in discrimination, whether it is um, economics, whether it's on small island developing states. Um, I mean, even for us in the CARICOM region, the issue of data collection is very much related to the issue of training of um, resource development. Um, and it's, I mean, if, if we are to effectively treat with it, I think the issue of training uh, development, the resource base of the respective countries that have these challenges, some people have been able to comfortably collect data and is the extent to which they are able to share um, you know, the strategies they have used, the training mechanisms. Um, if it is that, whether on a bilateral or multilateral level, we can address the issue of data collection um, and the issue of challenges, particularly for small island developing states, as it relates to data collection and training, I think that um, the continued um, aggressive approach, the continued need to, to keep it on the agenda um, but we, it, it's going to be difficult for us to address it in the way in which we need to address it. If the issue of demand and supply, if the, the inequalities in some of the smaller countries and even some of the larger countries as, as well, and both in terms of focus, recognition, and commitment, um, unless if that discussion continues, it will be extremely difficult to, to achieve um, that, that transition and that transformation that is necessary to deal with the issue of, of discrimination and, and racial impact. Thank you. I want to, um, in the last minute now, I want to uh, turn it back to uh, the uh, executive director of UN Women that has organized and hosted uh, this very uh, useful uh, panel discussion. Uh, to thank you for the opportunity that all of us have had to get together uh, to know and to hear from each other, to share thoughts, um, and uh, uh, to turn it back to you for your last thoughts as well. Thank you, Gail, and thank you so much to all of you for being so generous with your time, your ideas, and for giving us uh, guidance and food for thoughts. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, we have been wanting to do to really touch base uh, with the colleagues who are in the front lines and doing a lot of, 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 of the work and help and you can help us as the United Nations to fashion ourselves in a way that makes us relevant. Uh, because I think sometimes, you know, we have so many papers to push sometimes that we can, and, and one meeting after the other, we can get into a rush where you, you almost sometimes have to say, wait a minute, why are we doing this? 
So <laughs> you, you hold yourself and you, you have a reality check. And I think this is in some ways a moment like that, but of course it's even more real when we are out there in the field. Hopefully uh, life will become normal again and we can, we can go around. But the big takeaway and something that I want to also to leave uh, with our team is the importance of global solidarity. We are talking about racism and how it is affecting and it has affected and is still affecting black women. But also we want to look at racism that affects everyone else in a different way, but bring it together uh, at some point so that we can be in solidarity with each other. The only way we are going to be able to uh, make a difference is when we have a groundswell. And the groundswell must bring in everybody with their different issues. We must not delegitimize any issue and we must enable people to speak for themselves about what it is that they are feeling. And this is the journey that I hope we will start. And next time when we take on the issue on uh, racism uh, that is directed towards the Asians, I'm sure we will pick up this important uh, thread that we are talking about, which makes us all on the same team, so to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all to the panelists Thank and the audience. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank Looking you. forward to you coming to Mississippi. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> and to the Caribbean. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.